The father's eyes were crimson with God. His prayer mat was a boat. He pushed the prow through clockless hours until the sun rose, pushed the prow with ancient rhymes sparking from his tongue, phosphors falling into the flowing darkness. He knew that the devil swam behind the boat at all times, lithe, like a shark. So he filled his sail with faith and closed his eyes tightly. But every now and then he would choke up from the God of it all. The God welling up in guts and gizzards. The God burning in furnace of throat, in toes and lungs and nose and skull. And when it got too much, he would open his eyes and God spilled out. The father eyed his son and wife as they went to school and work each morning. He sat on the edge of the bed and read his holy book from dawn till dusk, stopping only to pray. The pages stained with thumb sweat. He read the calligraphy right to left. His deep voice rose and fell like a cardiogram. He understood very little of what he intoned, for it was not his mother tongue. But all that mattered was the closeness to God, the ecstasy of the word, the word that made itself known to him as it had once been revealed to a prophet in a cave. And the father had no job because God was enough. So the mother worked long hours to put food on the table, to put the son through school, a son who grew taller and wilder by the day. And the boy grew restless standing behind his father on the prayer mat, because try as he might, he had never felt the shiver of God run through him. So when they prepared to pray, the boy would ask, why? And the father would reply, because I said so, boy. So when they left to work and school each morning, the father would ask himself, could they not see? Could they not sense that the devil was swimming up behind them with his ceaseless yearning and his malignant heart? Could they not recognize that he must be outpaced with prayer? So he began to wake his wife and son up earlier and earlier, and, they, and he could sense that they were dying for sleep, drooling and drifting and swaying on the bow, but he piled up the words and the hours and the sermons and the God because he knew he was doing the right thing and he knew that their sails would be full of wind. But regardless, the boy would insist with his questions. Why must we read the holy book, Father? If God is so powerful, why does he need us to pray? Does he not need us as much as we need him? Why or why do we not get to choose our own path? And the father's eyes would glow crimson and he would reply, because I said so, boy. As his temper got shorter, the prayers got longer. And when the father beat the son, it was God in his knuckles and fists. God became fear, and in the boy, fear became God. The mother drove the boy to school every day in a second-hand white Corolla. She could see confusion in him, love and hate, and an inquisitiveness that was simmering to surrender. The car ride from home to school took exactly eight minutes. Eight minutes of freedom, eight minutes the only time they were ever alone together, mother and son, eight minutes in which to say, my beautiful boy, question everything, question your father, his holy books, his God, question those in power, the country you live in, question the things he has forbidden, question yourself, question the ever falling avalanche that is your heart, question me, question it all, my beautiful boy. So each day when the boy felt defeated by the slow drip torture of prayer, in those eight minutes from home to school, his mother would embolden him with golden words and the white car became like a monastery. And she would quote poets and playwrights and musicians. But most of all, she would say, my beautiful boy, question everything. And he saw how she was in the world, 
how she was big and fierce and suffered no fools, how she followed her own advice daily, how she questioned everything and everyone besides the father. And the boy would wonder why. Before he left home at last, there was a good day, the type of day you long for in the hard times. The father took the boy into the kitchen and said, my son, you will be leaving home soon, and a man must know how to cook. And so he taught the son how to cook rice and jackfruit curry with turmeric and chili and coconut cream. They smiled at each other and scraped the bowls clean. The father winked at him, but the sun was falling, and after several minutes, the father's eyes grew crimson. And the boy no longer asked why, but instead he looked downwards and said nothing. The boy grew up. He and the father would have a 10-year cold war that ended in an uneasy ceasefire, and they would call to each other from time to time over a no man's land covered with clouds the color of a bruise. And the boy would cook jackfruit curry sometimes. And as he stirred the pot, he thought about a story his mother had told him about the father's childhood in that eight minutes it took to get from home to school, about how his father was raised in a logging camp in a shanty by a man who gambled on roosters and dice games, a man who would beat him savagely out of the blue as if for sport, a man who told him that there was no God. And my, fa and my father would ask, why? And the man would reply, because I said so, boy. So when I write these poems, these brittle things adorned with gardens and graveyards, they seek to question everything, especially myself. And mostly the answer is less than brave. But every now and again, my heart flares with ferocious beauty and my sails are animated by something unseen. And although I say I don't believe in God, I have no other name for what it is that compels me. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.